just want to introduce myself really briefly. My name is Sasha Thackberry. I'm the District Director for eLearning Technologies at Cuyahoga Community College. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project we did in um, pre-algebra, which was a, an, a, actually a gamified MOOC. And um, part of the reason I chose m and for our, our first slide here is because um, I love what we're doing overall in the field, and then I get to take all of this amazing stuff and bring it back to the community college environment and try to bring it back to kind of the ground floor and the people that I serve and uh, my personal mission. And we're going to get there um, kind of at the, in the discussion part is what is your mission in terms of the audience you're serving and what are you hoping to accomplish. Um, so, so this is me. If you want to, um, I didn't realize there was a hashtag for the conference overall. So if you want to hashtag the conference, that's fine too. I'm Sasha T. Bear at just about everything. Or you can go to my site, which is edusasha.com. I'm a big, big believer in collaboration. So if anybody wants to get together after this and make something happen, um, let me know. OK, so have you all seen this graphic, which I love? which is Creative Commons license, of course. Um, so there was a big controversy, right? Like, what are MOOCs? Are they going to take away every, everything known as traditional education? Um, and, and if you're like me, if you're from the Princess Bride generation, this probably means quite a bit to you. I don't necessarily think that they mean what you think that they mean. And then we just saw this, this graphic, right? We're all, I'm sure, familiar with this graphic. Um, but when we talk about MOOCs, the majority of MOOCs are not the demographic that I serve. And in fact, they're not the demographic that we were able to hit with our MOOC. And it's kind of a different animal when you're trying to reach out to an audience that is not part of the connected community. Um, so this was our MOOC. So I'm actually going to stand up here because it's, it's a little bit well, no, you can probably see that. OK, so I renamed everything, right? So in addition to um, M being for massive, it's also for um, the fact that we used it for math dev ed. And I'm talking dev ed, pre-algebra, really kind of basic content. And just to give you a sense of our institution and why they were involved in this initiative is we have a huge dev ed challenge, specifically in math, also in English, but far more extreme nature in math. And what we're trying to do is get these students into college level math. The students who would have placed, say, into this course would have had three semesters of math classes ahead of them to get to college level math. So that's, um, that's a pretty significant challenge. And what we're trying to do is not make that take away their federal financial aid so they don't have to pay for this, um, not make it take an entire semester, which they lose of the ability to take a different class in that time. And um, there's a time clock on all this. The faster they get through dev ed, the more likely they are to be um, successful in getting an associate's degree or a workforce certificate. Um, it's also massive because it's actually a fiscally sustainable model. Uh, our state funding is uh, going to more of a success-based model as opposed to an entrance-based model. So previously, we got a lot of funding from serving an underserved population. That funding is being radically transformed. Our enrollment funding is gone. So it's all based on course completion, certain things called success points, and then exit. So it's really important for us to find a way to scale dev ed. Um, and then because it's massive, it, it also assists with our mission of access. So now we're focused on success, but we didn't change our mission. Anybody can come to a community college. That's why I'm at a community college. Um, I, I mean, I have a degree, but that's why I work at a community college. Um, and then the open part of it is we used all open educational re, uh, resources. So we didn't create anything out of whole cloth, with the exception of some of the videos we used um, didn't have closed captioning. And because we model what it is that we're hoping our faculty do, we had those closed captions. Um, we also used a free textbook that we got from Connections. Um, and then the, the online part is kind of interesting. Um, our students don't always have a real concrete sense of agency, so a, a connection between the work that they're doing and the results that come out of it. Sometimes these things feel like they're out of control, that maybe they have more to do with luck than with purpose. So what we did was we used a gamified environment, and that creates what we, what we call a low-risk failure. So a student could come and jump right to the first-level assessment and then fail it. And then they could go back and review resources and try it again and fail it again, and go back and try it again and fail it again. We don't care. 
as long as they eventually get to 80% success, which was our criteria, we didn't do C and above because our data shows that if a student gets a C in a dev ed class, sure they'll pass that course, they're not gonna pass the next one. So they're not gonna be successful in their next class. So that's why we set the bar a little bit higher. Um, we also, uh, it's my personal fascination, this concept of building resilience, and gamified environments tend to do that, in addition to this sense of agency. But they also, um, they also provide like the, the willingness to try again and again, which is what we're hoping they're gonna take away, not just from the content, but from the practice of learning that they will bring back into their um, formal credit-based courses. So we're, we're kind of trying to model what we want them to be as a student as well. Um, and then of course, the, the C is in our, in our case both for competency-based education, because it, we use game mechanics, it was a competency-based course. You could not advance until you achieved 80% on the level. You couldn't even see the next content until you achieved 80% on the level. So it really, um, I don't know if any of you are fans of Jane McGonigal that came up in an earlier session, but gamers fail 80% of the time, right? So, and um, historically our, our fail rate in community colleges for dev ed math, it's not quite that high, but, but not too far away from it nationally. So it's really important that we um, provide environments where our students are not going to be, um, not going to kind of incorporate into their student experience the sense that they're failing, but instead give them the sense that they can just keep trying again and again. And again, it was, um, they, they couldn't get through the success rate in the course until they made it at 80%. So just a few differences between um, the traditional MOOC X, X MOOC, caveat, um, and our gamified X MOOC is that um, our student population had little or no college. Um, many of our students, I have some of the stats there, but um, they, they had some college and we don't really know what that entails, but it means no degree. Um, and then we also had a wraparound story, which is interesting. We didn't really get into the narrative concept of games, so, um, but there is a whole, whole other series of, of research and interesting things about you know, taking on the role of the hero, and it goes back to Joseph Campbell and all that good stuff, but that's not exactly what we did. We had like a loose wraparound story. Um, we used existing OER, we leveled up. We also used digital badges. Does anybody use digital badges? Uh, so we did it for each level in the MOOC. We used them within course sites which was the platform that we used primarily because our full-time faculty who we had working on it were used to Blackboard. So they didn't have to learn a new LMS while they were doing it. Um, but they integrate with um, Mozilla Open Badges um, so students can take them with them. Um, we also used instructional video, but it wasn't based on um, an instructor. So it wasn't a person that they identified with as being their instructor at the front of the classroom in a lecture-based format. So they didn't ever see an embodiment of an instructor. Okay, so we also did, how am I doing on my time here? Okay, I gotta talk fast. So we had, a, I talk fast normally, so this is probably a little dizzying. Okay, if I have to, is, is anyone already like, whoa, slow down? Okay, is okay, okay. So we got this uh, Gates Foundation grant to do this, and we had a pretty ambitious project that we wanted to do, and we had a, a really rapid development cycle. We didn't know it at the time, but this actually made us the first community college in the nation to have a MOOC. We just wanted to get it done. So we, we came up with the first iteration of the MOOC, and then we did it four times, and we did kind of some tweaks along the way, primarily with the facilitation of it, but the idea is that we're able to kind of make those changes in an agile way. Um, and this was kind of the gamified story. So we're from Cleveland, I'm from Cleveland, and it was, you know, um, like Survivor. I don't watch Survivor, but I'm told this is like a big deal, like Survivor. So instead of um, Cleveland, it was Believe Island. There were a lot of discussions on whether it should be Believeland or Believe Island. <laughs> so this is what we came up with. 
And um, we actually got custom graphics created uh, actually by the husband of our instructional designer at the time. Our caveat, um, we work at a community college, so we beg, borrow, and steal resources from wherever we can. Um, and there's this kind of wraparound story where you get through challenges and you're able to like, you know, get water or you get your compass back, you're attacked by a band of monkeys. You know, but the great thing about the, the course is that you don't need the story. And in fact, the entire course is openly licensed. Um, if you go to try-c.edu slash MOOC, you can get to it. You can rip and burn it in its entirety today. You can take it. We encourage you to take it. And if you do take it, let us know how it works out, because we want to know. Um, so we had instructional videos from a variety of places, but as I said, they were not instructor specific. There were also activities that were put in there. We had um, checkpoints. So before they got to the level assessment, they could kind of self-assess and see how they were doing. Um, and then they got the badges and they unlocked the next level. So again, they didn't see the level until they were there. Um, and those are our badges. It's interesting because we had someone who was studying for the GRE in our, in our office who took it and has all the batches now. Okay, so our results, really briefly, this was um, our level of educational attainment. And as you can see, it's very different than what we would think of as, as a typical um, MOOC attendee or MOOC participant. Um, we had a lot of people that just had some college, 40%, um, which is an interesting flip from the average MOOC, right, with 40% of them having master's degrees. Um, and then our completion stats were actually kind of uh, impressive. It ended up being more of a LOOC you know, instead of a MOOC, and there were a couple of reasons for that. One is which is really hard to explain to people what a MOOC is if they're not really used to online courses even. like. Um, I think over 50% of our people actually knew what an online course is and had taken at least one. But a, a large segment, I think it was like 40%, had never even taken an online course. So this was a very different experience for them. And capturing that audience was really challenging. So we were putting out, you know, um, ads places. We were trying to get all of our students to take it. It was, it was definitely reaching a non-networked audience is a different animal than reaching a networked audience. Um, but, oh, but when you think about that, that's an amazing success rate for a MOOC. 18.4%, um, like I, I, I've heard between five and 10% is completion and success, right? Like five tends to be full success, meaning everything was completed. 10%, like it was complete, but you didn't do everything or what. So um, that's, that's kind of impressive. And I attribute it to the design, because if anything, we should have seen less completion rates in our MOOC because of our audience. We should have seen less and we saw more. So the only thing it brings me to is back to learner motivation again, learner motivation and the way it was actually designed. Um, some of them were currently enrolled, so we're hoping that some of that 27.4% were actually our students or students we managed to capture. And this is an interesting comparison. Um, so if you filter out from our, at Cuyahoga Community College, our actual um, statistics for students that passed what would be the comparable course, very similar objectives, um, there's only a 10% differential between our success and completion rate and the success and completion rate. Now, granted, this is 80% or above. So we didn't include, we had students that passed at Tri-C with a C that aren't in this metric because we wanted to make it as apples to apples as possible. And so um, that's kind of remarkable when you consider um, the 18% didn't have any skin in the game. They didn't have to pay for anything. Um, nothing was gonna happen to them if they failed the course or failed to complete the course. Ah, very good. So a normal, a normal, um, time frame would be a 16 week semester. You can also take it, we also have a 14 week. Um, ours was four weeks. And the reason we made our MOOC only four weeks is because we had looked at the data, now granted, totally different learner demographic, but the data that was coming out at the time, and remember this was two years ago, was showing that in the fourth week, MOOC participation was cratering. So you were seeing first week, second week, third week, fourth week, boom. 
And so we were like, okay, well, let's take the information we know we have and make it four weeks. Um, I should also mention that it is currently open on course sites, unfacilitated. Anybody can come in and out. And the success rate for that is only 7.4%. So I do think the condensed timeline, the fact that it was um, focused in a different way, was helpful. We also tend to lose students throughout the course of the semester at the community college for various reasons. Four weeks is a lot more edible than 14. It wasn't like the first four weeks is the most basic four weeks. It was, you took 16 compensatory. They did take away, they didn't take away um, huge chunks of the skill set that was needed, but there wasn't as much, um, like, as much incremental practice and things. Do you know what I mean? So it wasn't like, there wasn't as much. The finals were the same in some sense. Yes, yes. And we tracked it all the way back to the objectives. The faculty were uh, amazing on this project. We had an amazing team, instructional designers. I mean, we just... You know, it was a $50,000 grant through the Gates Foundation, but the most important thing that the Gates Foundation did was just give us the legitimacy that they believed in the potential of this model for us to really be able to do it. Not that we wouldn't, this is being videoed, not that we wouldn't love a multi-million dollar grant from the Gates Foundation. We could do so much with more than $50,000. Um, so we have a little Compass data here. And this is Compass. Are you guys familiar with Compass? No? OK. So Compass is a placement test that we use at the community college level. It's actually becoming increasingly controversial um, because so many people end up placing into DevEd, right? Like, is this even a good assessment? Um, and we're not even going to get into the question of, does someone seeking a non-STEM related associate's degree really need Need to, to graph quadratic equations. That's like a separate question that we're not going to address here. So we only had a, a very limited subset. This was self-reported. Um, and of the 64 students who provided us with their S number, so that doesn't mean there were more. We just got the data from these. Um, only 13 took a pre and post that we could track. It was incredibly messy data to get and work with. And that is what we found was the ultimate challenge, was getting the data and filtering it. And, it was, it was kind of a hot mess. But 76% um, of them um, placed either in a higher course or placed out of dev ed, which is weird because we didn't put content into that to place them out of dev ed. So which is showing us one of two things. We use Khan Academy resources, teacher tube stuff, other stuff. So maybe students who were already going to be successful now were able to, to access the resources to get them there on their own. Or they needed a refresher, right? So there's a, there's a couple different ways to look at this. And it's 13, like n equals 13, right? So you can't really draw too many conclusions, except it's encouraging enough to get more data, right? OK, so this is the reflection part. This is not a pop quiz. I just said that. OK, so I actually want you to do this individually right now. And then we're going to, I think we can break like safely maybe into two or three groups. Um, because I really want uh, the, the f most frustrating Oh, let me t touch my microphone. The most frustrating thing I found about the conference is I'm loving it so much. I want I actually want to talk more about it. And when they're passing around the microphone, sometimes it's like, no, no, I want that microphone. So what we're going to do is discuss in small groups and then report out. So you're going to have to come up with a product. Um, so right now, what I actually want you to do is write down why you're motivated in MOOCs. So there's a couple of different reasons I'm doing this, one of which I'm sure you know is when you define your motivation ahead of time, it's easier for you to decide what you're going to be doing with it and also what you want out of this experience. So go ahead and actually write this down. I'm going to actually time you, roughly. So start now, and I will come get you at 2.53. Just three questions.
30 second warning. All right. Okay, so hopefully you already had a sense of what motivates you to, to engage in these things. But um, the reason I wanted you to write it down is because some of what we're going to be talking about is what you've done with MOOCs, but also what you want to do with MOOCs, and what, as a result of this or the other presentations, you might want to take a, a back into your model and make some changes. Because uh, the whole theme of this workshop is we're not anymore focusing on the scale. We are focusing on the learning. So what are some different ways that we might be able to do that? OK, so now we're going to be in groups. OK, um, so maybe like the. There's really no good way to do this. So maybe like the three of you here, the four of you, my little quadrant back there, and then this half of the room. There's only five of you, right? You can manage. OK. So just take one minute and, and introduce yourself to each other. So this is like forced networking, right? Like say your name, what organization you're from. Exchange business cards if you have them. So you ran with You only have one minute, so don't don't share your life story. One minute. Okay, and just to interrupt for a minute, I'm hearing you're already going this direction, so let's go ahead and go in this direction, um, which is when, when you're introducing yourselves or talking about your projects, um, go ahead and talk about the specific purpose of either one you've created and run or one you've participated in, whatever your preference is, um, and what, where were you successful, but also how did you define success? We talk a lot about completion rates, but I've been in several MOOCs. I had absolutely no intention of completing. Um, so I, sh I was there to like, n you know, nab things or check it out. Um, and then who is your audience for either the MOOC you participate in or one you've designed? And did you meet that target audience? So were you either the demographic that was being targeted for whatever reason, or were you able to find your targeted audience? OK, so go ahead. Y'all were starting on that anyway, so go ahead. Yeah, that's 
themselves in uh, the most simplistic form. You're at which university? Sorry. Cornell University. Cornell, okay. Um, I have a background in the field of teaching and science, and it's research and online. The objective of the project was to design courses that engage students in the organization and that we could actually, where we could actually um, assess the outcomes of the design and give them presentations. Uh, actually, you know, we chose to. So, the instructor had a, had a know how to build those kinds of things. You could just throw a random question. Um, because anything you try to do on higher level thinking, you can't assess. Yeah. Um, we're waiting to get the data and have the perspective. So, um, for us, it's really important that we um, get people to think about diversity and inclusion all over the world, um, not just within the corridors and support panels, but individuals who are sitting anywhere. Really feel about becoming a member of Catalyst. Or Catalyst, um, Catalyst. So we haven't created a book yet. Um, here we just joined, um, officially joined a week ago. So it's all about learning from um, community. I'm Dan McFadden from Berkeley College of Design. Berkeley Online, actually, which is our, the online part of the school. So for a long time now, we've been building. 12 week courses with 20 students mm -hmm. or less in the yeah, section. Yeah. Oh, feedback from uh, an author or an instructor. Yeah. Okay. So we've yeah. kind of more than dipped our toe, we've kind of jumped into the. Put on steroids. To uh, basically, you know, we've run several courses. The struggle has been very good. Mm, yeah, that would be nice. How to grade and assess creative activity, like a song or poetry or something, in uh, more massive set of students than Yeah, that's our ongoing social Have you guys all had a chance to kind of share? Or do you need a couple more minutes? Good? Okay, I'm going to have us bring it together and record it. All right, if you could kind of close up. I want to hear a little bit from each group. Um, there was some great stuff going on over there, and I want to make sure that everybody can, can share a little bit. So why don't I start over here with our largest group? <gasps> oh no, really? <laughs> You're still introducing Andrew Jackson. Okay, I'll I'll throw another question at them. You continue. Um, 
I will in one minute. Thank you. You guys were accelerated. <laughs> completion is the ultimate goal? No. Okay. Because I think that's where our internal conversation started. Like, we want them to complete the move. And it's been kind of this transforming conversation because is that the sole goal of our students? Is that the sole goal? Yeah. Which is usually those that are up to second moving through. Then you can look at their assessments and see how they're actually learning. Right. I want to ask them too. You know what? I, we haven't ever asked students who come in what what is your goal in this move. Oh, we do that. You see, you do okay. So what? 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 Is, like answers have you gotten? Are they all there to complete, or are they all there to? There are variety. Some are there just to like poke around. Or, yeah. Just interested in looking at it or discovering new topics, but and then some are there like yeah, I want to learn the whole course, but it, it's a range. No, that's fine. Should I should I stand so like right here? Is this better? Oh my god. So I have a question for you. We can ask them to cut out. You did you were your is your open course open? It was run originally in four four week segments, four consecutive four week segments, and that's the one we got the good success rates. When we just opened it up, we pulled the last time we pulled the data just from core sites, it was like a seven point four percent as opposed to the 18.4% that we saw before. So we did find, I mean, it's probably some combination of it being specifically marketed as a MOOC. You know, like this is a four-week MOOC as opposed to this is just living up there. You know, but also faculty are, are thinking about using it in different ways now. 
And so it brings up other conversations. Like they're now having conversations about doing the entire dev ed math spectrum without textbooks, right? So it takes it back to a design conversation. Let's talk about the content as opposed to the materials that we're using to deliver things. You know what I mean? So it, I think it changes the whole conversation almost around pedagogy in some ways. We did something really subtle. Now. Right now, the majority of ours are open. Mm -hmm. You can come and go, mm -hmm. consume what you want, self paced. Um, but we took one and we offered an incentive to complete it in 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And we saw an amazing update. Awesome. So, um, it, yeah, that's true. A car. <laughs> you know, the, the incentive was um, the, the move was one that you built a, a learning portfolio and have it assessed for college level credit. The assessment is $1,500. And for completing it within 10 weeks, we drop the price to 100. And College credit for 100 bucks? That's and you can stick deal. on 15 classes inside the portfolio. So it was a monetary you know, type of encouragement. Right. But we saw an immediate change. Hmm. Well, I would even so honestly, I would even, I, I can't currently, because I'm, I'm also a PhD student at Kent State, and I can't currently do a PLA or do an e-portfolio to get credit. I would still pay for the credits if I didn't have to sit through the class. Do you know what I mean? I would create that e-portfolio. I'm like on my last semester of coursework now, and it is it's hard to do with two kids. It's not the content that's killing me. It's the negotiations with my husband, that poor man, who is still married to me. But yeah. well, I'm, so, was, was, I'm glad you brought that up, because that's something we were thinking about changing you know, this next year. Some of our yeah, it's, it's definitely, I think, just like when the concept of online courses came out or the concept of instructional design, it changes the conversation about what's going on here in the classroom. And I think that that's what we're seeing. I mean, it's so interesting. We're all talking about the flipped classroom now. That happened in K-12 like 10 years ago. But it's really, it's interesting that, yeah, we're all, <laughs> say what? Even longer. Yeah. No, it had, right? And Jigsaw and all that stuff. We're like, woohoo. For, yeah. <laughs> all right. OK, so we're going to do a little report out now. And I just want to get a sense from each group, because we've done these little, I, I'm going to make you move in a minute. And there's a purpose for this, because this is actually, um, I'm like that awkward person at the cocktail party, right? Like, I'll go up and I'll talk to one person. But the whole purpose is to get everybody talking. So I'm going to have a couple people from each, each group that aren't particularly, um, like that are OK to just move around to move to the next group so that the next conversation you have can be with a couple different people and you can introduce yourselves again. But just some of the takeaways, um, kind of talk a little bit about in, from this group, were there differences in target audiences that you found? What, what were your content areas? We're all over the map, really. Really, right? We have music, we have math. Awesome. <laughs> well, those two are really connected, right? They are, yeah. But their grading is very Yes, also true. Exactly, and how to accomplish that. Um, I'm from Smithsonian, so we're sort of crossing a range of disciplines, and right. we're sort of in development with our first suite of courses right now. So, um, so you're keep talking. As much of a partner as an institution, um, and then Krista, you can. <laughs> oh yeah, and you know I'm from a nonprofit. We're a new member of uh, edX, and Sorry. so um, we're focused on, um, you know bringing our uh, research and content and putting it on a, a I think you, I think it was on. Okay. Was it on, guys? I, I don't yeah, know. you're good. All right. It's not connected. It's not huge, yeah. So I think it just feeds into the camera. Yeah, and, and so as we think about audience for the work that we're doing in my company called Catalyst, um, we don't have the traditional student learners, we have corporate learners. Okay. So it's a very different approach um, for maybe some of the traditional thinking about around what and how a MOOC is created. So. And then um, I'm at edX, I'm one of the program managers and I'm, we're working on an initiative right now where we're expanding our course offerings to include more introductory and like high school and pre-college courses. So um, that's that's kind of what our target audience That's is. awesome. That's where we are. We should connect afterwards. 
Okay, so I'm just going to come around here, kind of give everybody a, a chance to talk about their target audience. Um, it was definitely interesting this morning because I, I want to take like 15 MOOCs now, right? I can't because I'm in graduate school myself. But it's like that continual informal learning, which is what we're so trying to foster at kind of the community college level, that, that confidence and that continual lifelong learning. So we're trying to build um, an edX that will change the nature of computer science in 11th grade so that it opens access to every single person in 11th grade, not just the people who have traditionally gotten computer science. Only one in 12 high school students has a computer science course at their high school, one in 12. So if you happen to roll the, roll the die with your parents and live in the right city in the right, right suburb, uh, then you'll get access, but otherwise you're not getting access. So we're trying to create a course that will be blended, that will be mm -hmm. you know, coming from above, but Spock delivered so that each high school teacher can grab it and feel like it's a resource and work within, even if it's a technology person who doesn't really know the material, the MOOC kind of drives it and they're in there to help it. So it's kind of a blended model for that to, to change the conversation, broaden participation in computing. And I'm not developing a MOOC, but my interest in MOOCs has always been in the sort of broadening participation, open access, mm -hmm. and how to make that really a reality, because it's currently not, um, at least at the X MOOC level. And so I think for me, it's really, you know, I'm very interested in OERs and how to make OERs useful for as many people as possible, and sort of what characteristics and features should they have to be, to be um, accessible and useful for all. Right. Hi, I'm Linda Grisham. I'm at Mass Bay, Massachusetts Bay Community College, and so uh, I can ditto. <laughs> we can <Yeah>. ditto <laughs> uh, the, the population. Of, uh, I guess it was two years ago now, uh, we used edX material uh, for a computer programming course and uh, brought it down to our community college, uh, and we had great success with it. I mean, we had started out with um, 18 students who dropped out, but all 16 finished. And the reason why is because the instructor really looked at the material and said, okay, this needs to be translated. This needs to be, people don't realize how much cultural bias is actually in the materials that are there. Uh, so he provided contacts, he provided vocabulary, and also he, pro he provided uh, interactive tutorials. In fact, the students could have done this fully online, actually, with his tutorials and then with the edX material that was there. So um, I'm interested in, what did she say, the uh, equalized access. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's our mission anyways, right? So um, to speak to the OER thing, too, so much of what we found was either text-based or video, and the interactive piece is really kind of missing, and the activities piece is really missing. And so um, I'm encouraged that they're coming up with some more of these interoperable languages, and so hopefully they won't all be, you know, we've all had SCORM challenges, right? I'm Sejal, and I'm from UT Austin, from um, Austin, Texas, and we've I manage the MOOC program, um, and we have project managers who individually de help develop the MOOCs on campus. And I'm, I'm just really interested in seeing all the variety of projects and just the faculty innovations that come out of these because the MOOC platform really is a place for also for faculty experiment, right? They can go and try to their heart's content, sort of like, oh, let me try an experiment with online design, on interactives, and how they might work out online. So um, it's just amazing what faculty really come up with as far as innovations and trying to make pedagogy and instruction sort of translate on the online level. So that really motivates me just seeing the variety that comes out in different disciplines and different faculty, different departments all across campus. I'm Vanna White today. Or wait a minute, that's not Vanna White. I don't no, know. You, you Some other person who runs around with a letter. The yeah, there we go. I'm there you go. Oh, that's Flip awkward. It. Um, Susan Huggins, Kaplan University. I'm the director of a new initiative that we just launched uh, not even 60 days ago, Open College at Kaplan University. Started actually last year as a small project called Open Learning at Kaplan University. So we, we put uh, MOOCs out in um, the Kaplan environment which is a little uh, thinking outside the box, to attract people to the college, to try out some of our courses in the open space without committal of tuition, without committal of enrollment, to come try the college. If you liked us, enroll, and you could also get credit for the MOOCs. Um, we had such um, a great interest that we thought we would solidify what were 
we thought of as, uh, as open learning. So we transitioned to the open college at KU. And in the open college, we've actually um, expanded our, our focus and our goal of helping learners seek those open resources to finish their degrees, to bring their open courses back to us, and we'll assess them for college level credit and also award that degree. Uh, we'll be launching an open degree uh, in about 60 days as well. Uh, a lot of assessments, a lot of assessments. Um, so we're really, really excited. And who our audience is, um, we're not really sure. We're, we think it's going to be the motivated learner, we initially thought it was going to be adult learners with some college and no degree, and that's probably still our, our audience. Um, but I think I think we'll be surprised, as we have with most of our initiatives. I think it's it, we're going to have a varied audience. Uh, hi, I'm Xiaoling Xie. I'm from Stanford University. So I'm, uh, I work at an in, uh, initiative called Understanding Language. Our PI is Kenji Hakuta. He's like the rock star in um, educational policy. So what we do is we provide um, MOOCs for teachers, K-12 teachers, especially in-service teachers. So the teachers who took our courses should have access to classroom. Why? Because we ask them to go into the classroom, record their students' conversation, and then reflect. We, we invited some kind of rubric for them to look at the conversation and reflect on it. And I guess uh, MOOCs for us, um, we not only, it's not just as a tool to deliver the content to the participants, teachers, but also we use it as a way to collect um, data. As I said, we ask teachers to collect their student discourse samples. So we are actually thinking of reuse those student uh, language samples to make a database that can feed back to the whole education society. That's also the OER thing we're thinking about. Um, so were our courses successful? I guess so, because we have um, a lot of school districts and states get interested and because this whole MOOC is just free, so they all love to work with us, and then we start to like make more customized content. For example, we're now working with Seattle District and also LA District. So um, they took our courses, and then we also go into their students' classroom, uh, teachers' classrooms, to record what they do in the classroom, and then we use the, all, those, all those videos back into our courses. Um, so I think um, to define success, and as I also brought in our group. Uh, the platform we use is NovoEd, uh, which promotes like team collaboration, and we we believe that um, it's better for teachers to work with uh, maybe someone who who teach like them, so they can learn from each other. But then, how do we um, define success? For this, um, I guess there are different levels of success. For example, since the participants are teachers, you want to know first whether they they get the concept from the course, and then how do they transfer that into their uh, instructional actions. And then overall, they are teachers. Like when we go to um, foundations, ask for fundraising, they always ask, how do, you how do you assess the students? Like the students' performance is another thing that's a big thing from how do we um, define success. And um, the other thing is, since we are doing team collaboration, Maybe a lot of teachers, they come in, they don't really imagine they can have some kind of instructional change, but they just want to connect with other people. So maybe that's a, the other way to define success or assess success. So there are a lot of challenges we're still trying to figure. Yeah. I think we're all there. Yeah. It's not just you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kim Kenyon, Associate Director of the Center for Teaching Excellence at Cornell University. Uh, I could say so much, but I won't do that. <laughs> um, we've actually been through one round of MOOCs. Um, we're currently in our second round. We don't have our data back from our first round yet. Like many people, we're trying to put that into a format that's usable for us. Um, we're a land-grant institution. We're both private and public. Um, so the objective for creating these really is varied depending on what the faculty we're thinking about. My role is to support faculty with the Cornell X team in developing the best courses possible, looking at backward design, outcomes, activities assessment, that whole kind of idea. Um, looking at the data that we have seen so far, and I use data as a loose term, um, we have achieved that particular goal. Uh, but, you know, if we're thinking about redefining assessment, I'm um, looking at the edX platform and some of the limitations of utilizing the tools. 
we would like to continue to push kind of the boundaries in that particular realm. And I think, um, you know, measuring success at the university level versus the faculty and individual level is, it's all over the place. Um, you know, some folks might say, well, we want to reach high school students. But many of us know that high school students, in most cases, aren't actually who's t actually taking these. So that's, that. you know, how do you measure? I don't know, uh, to be quite honest with you, given that we have different ideas about what the target audience is. Um, and we don't have our data back. So we're learning. Um, we, you know, we're in the midst of the pilot kind of stage one, maybe two, and we will continue to reevaluate, follow kind of the norm of assessment planning, um, and, and continue to improve, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all of you sharing. Did we have another request to share? Or are you just coming back this I was way? just coming back this way. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so. Um, Wow, an hour goes really fast, doesn't it? So um, I was hoping, okay, so this is, I, I was gonna do this like a, a kind of shock and awe thing, but um, looking at the design and delivery, um, in terms of the intentional process, and I know the group that I was sitting with, we did have kind of a, a discussion that there was backwards design and there was kind of this intentional process going into it, because this has been hurry up and MOOC in a lot of instances, that kind of process for intentional design and delivery hasn't always happened. So I was gonna have you discuss that, and then I was gonna say, now create a tweet. But because we don't probably have time to um, discuss in detail and then create tweets, um, just work in the groups that you're already in and create 140 characters. Actually, try to do it in 130 because then we can put, um, you know, at the learning with MOOCs thing and everybody can see them. So one for each of you individually about your specific design and development process. Um, and I, let's keep this really brief because I want to give just a, a few minutes at the end for what could you um, big borrow or steal from someone else's MOOC, either the MOOC that I shared with you or a different MOOC in order to inform your practice moving forward. So we'll take just a couple of minutes, do this actually individually, otherwise it'll take too long, and then we'll talk a little bit about what elements you might like to take or experiment with or something that maybe even someone else in your group said that you'd like to incorporate moving forward. Um, so two or three minutes, if, even if you're not on Twitter, it doesn't matter, I'm gonna tweet them. So just take a couple minutes, less than 140 characters, 130 if you can do it. How were they designed and developed? Okay. People are gonna think I'm not paying attention to my own presentation because I'm tweeting. Okay, one more minute. If you haven't tweeted before, I'll, I'll come to you last.
right, anybody have one? 130 characters is harder than you might think. Okay, we'll take another minute. No pressure. All right, go for it. I converted my textbook into interactive visualizations and problems, added tablet videos, and then got shingles. Oh, <laughs> is that true? Okay, is that 130 characters or less? I'm sure it is. Okay, all right, not 130 words. Okay, start at the beginning. I'll see how much we can get it. Converted my textbook into interactive visualizations and problems, made tablet videos, and then got shingles. <laughs> OK, say it one more time. I'm sorry. Converted textbook. Converted my textbook into interactive visualization and problems. I mean, tablet videos. Uh huh. And got shingles. And got shingles. Okay, got it. All right, next one. Uh, focus on rich media learning with an emphasis on creating a supportive community with shared interests and diverse backgrounds. I got rich media learning. <laughs> with an emphasis okay. on creating a supportive community with shared interests and diverse backgrounds. And if you are on Twitter, you can go back and um, retweet these and identify yourselves, if you want to, obviously. All right. Next. Say, say what? You tweeted yours. <laughs> oh, you already tweeted it? I don't listen well, so I already tweeted mine. Oh, no, 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 that's OK. If you already tweeted it, that's all right. Does anyone else want to share? If you don't want to, seriously, I'm not going to pressure you. And I said modular, modularized. Modularized. That's actually a really interesting thing, because I think we are going to see more of that in the future. All right. Well, I just wanted to wrap up here. We're at time. Thank you all so much for being willing to talk so much. I think that's what's been um, so powerful about a workshop like this, is you can really dig in and get to know other people. If you would like a business card, I have them. Um, we believe in open. So if you want any resources from me, um, also, we just recently um, published an article, I forget what journal, um, called The Many Shades of MOOCs, about six different MOOCs at six, six different colleges that were the first QM recognized MOOCs in the nation. So if you uh, are looking up that, it's a very interesting um, article about that. So thank you all so much. And go forth, wait a minute, I have a slide that says go forth and MOOC. We had more activities we didn't get through. Go forth and MOOC well. Thank you so much.